more times. That will be five in a year. That's a lot more than once every six months. So I'm glad you've given me another justification, Deb, to come here. Really good to be here. Um, it's a city here which is uh, expanding at a fast pace, uh, like the state, indeed like the nation, uh, expanding uh, at a fast rate and requires, as a result, secure and sustainable supplies of energy to power that growth. And achieving those secure and those sustainable uh, energy supplies is at the heart of the collaboration between the UK and India uh, on policy, on innovation and in business. Uh, obviously we both need uh, energy to power our growth, to meet the needs of our citizens and to build that resilience uh, both uh, in the economy and in terms of climate uh, against those shocks and stresses that both are subjected to. But we want to do more than just simply to ensure an adequate quantity of supply. We're also concerned about the quality of our energy sources, where they come from, uh, how they're generated, what impacts and benefits they deliver to our economies, to our societies, uh, and to our environment. So that's why the UK and India have for some time referred to secure and sustainable energy as the purpose of our joint work on energy, which spans oil and gas, renewables, energy efficiency, uh, and civil nuclear, and based uh, very strongly on a common commitment to Paris. It's not just the right thing to do, uh, it's also the smart economic thing to do. We both recognize the commercial opportunities that can be realized in uh, the low carbon economy. So in the case of the UK, the low carbon sector alone is worth almost 50 billion pounds across nearly 100,000 companies, businesses, and it employs about a quarter of a million full-time workers directly and indirectly uh, supports many more. We're both taking action. India's extraordinarily stretching target is to bring its renewable energy capacity up to 175 gigawatts by 2022. We are driving action ourselves in the UK to decarbonize our economy. We're setting concrete carbon budgets in law to help us reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2050. Back in March, there was a day where for the first time since the Industrial Revolution, no energy was generated in the UK via coal. And there was a lunchtime in June when over 50% uh, of our energy requirements in the UK were being generated by renewables. So those common priorities and challenges make us very, in my view, natural partners for collaboration. Our engagement was given indeed a new momentum uh, in April, uh, the first India-UK energy dialogue held under the banner of the India-UK Energy for Growth Partnership. New strategic priorities on power, on renewables were agreed at that occasion. Uh, very useful connections were made between UK companies and their Indian counterparts. And on the subject of UK and India companies, I must mention I'm truly delighted uh, to be here to support Deb, whose joint ventures with Synergist uh, on the board behind me, uh, the British Energy Company, is a great example of that collaboration and partnership between India and Britain. There's a similar story uh, unfolding in innovative solar technology being incubated in the northeast of England through Big Solar Limited, where Deb is also uh, an investor. And I hope there can be many more such partnerships between Britain and India and indeed between Britain and West Bengal. We both need to uh, attract investments into energy and power generation in the UK to replace our old generation of power plants that will retire soon and in India obviously to meet the growing demand for power that will double by the year 2030. We both need to, to develop clean energy sources, uh, a greater share of clean power in our energy mix and more efficient use of energy makes sense for our economies and our societies as well as increasing 
the sustainability of our energy mix. It also enhances our security by bringing online new, cleaner domestic supplies of energy that will help decrease dependence on energy uh, imports. We both need to uh, boost the efficiency because using more energy more frugally and effectively is a key plank of that security element and helps to reduce the cost of business. We forged some very impressive partnerships on energy security and sustainability uh, and tackling the challenge of climate change. These have resulted in progress against our renewable energy targets, enabling the flow of investments and the scaling up of the technologies. So I'm just going to highlight a few examples. The scale of the infrastructure investment needed uh, in India is huge, some $3.6 trillion, I think, by 2040. So India and the UK recently announced that uh, we would invest £120 million each into a clean, uh, to fund a clean energy projects under the, uh, India's National Infrastructure Investment Fund. And the aim of that government injection of money is to attract an additional £500 million worth of international investors' money. Uh, we've worked with a range of companies, including IREDA, to support their efforts to raise capital through the green bonds issued on the London Stock Exchange. And in that context, it was a real pleasure to see Rural Electrification Corporation's $450 million green bond issued last month. Our research and our innovation work are going to advance through a joint virtual centre on clean energy together with the Department of Science and Technology. We are collaborating at both central and at state level on a power sector reform initiative that will help utilities become fit for the future by absorbing renewables, delivering demand side management and to keep energy costs affordable for customers. And I'm going to take uh, this opportunity to congratulate Energy Efficiency Services Limited, EESL, for collaborating with us and for launching their operations in the UK. I'm pleased to note that EESL is looking at forming strategic partnerships with British companies and we'll be very happy to extend our support towards making such alliances happen. I hope officials from EESL have had fruitful discussions with uh, British companies yesterday. And lastly on this list of examples, uh, in the recent past, indeed the very first visit I made here in Kolkata, we worked very closely with uh, West Bengal on rooftop solar and on strategies for low carbon and for climate resilient growth for Kolkata. Earlier uh, we worked with the Department of Power on power sector reforms and on renewable energy policy and I'd like to take this opportunity if I may to congratulate Sri Savanda Chattopadhyay, uh, Honourable Minister and his team uh, for the very commendable work on energy efficiency and clean energy in the state. I'd also like to thank him for meeting the delegation of UK energy companies yesterday and I'm pleased to note I hope it's your view, uh, Honourable Minister, that, that uh, you've had a very productive discussion uh, with them and they with you uh, on uh, UK Bengal, uh, at the UK Bengal session on regulatory frameworks and technologies on clean energy. So take that together. Uh, I believe we can do really good business, uh, achieve real change, which is important. I strongly believe we can do even better together on this agenda by leveraging that finance, uh, by sharing skills and expertise, by mobilizing the efforts on research and development and forging the new commercial partnerships. Today, as I said, there are quite a few British energy companies in this room uh, working very closely with their Indian partners to deliver our shared priorities of energy security and sustainability. And they're going to showcase their unique strength across the energy spectrum later today. I'm sure you'll benefit from that interaction with them. This conclave, uh, I honestly believe, offers an excellent opportunity to explore the partnerships for a shared economic growth, for delivering on both energy and the environment. And I wish you all a very successful, a very productive event. So thank you very much indeed.
Thank you very much, Sir Dominic, for, uh, uh, for your address <coughs> and for your very kind and generous words. Uh, may I now request uh, our President, uh, Mr. Shutonu Ghosh, to deliver his address. You are conscious of the time. Thank you, Deb. Yeah, actually, I was looking through my speech and seeing, you know, where, where I could, you know, cut it. Sri Shobundeb Chattopadhyay, Honorable Minister in Charge, Power and Non-Conventional Energy Sources, Government of West Bengal. His Excellency, Sir Dominic Asquith. His Excellency, Akhil Zuliashvil. His Excellency, Shupendra Tripathi. Mr. Shauf Hosen, Dr. Ajay Mathur, Mr. Deb Mukherjee, Mr. Arun Mukherjee, other dignitaries present here today, good morning. I'm oh, sorry, have we already crossed over? Yeah, we have. We are currently thrust in an era of economic volatility caused by the critical interlinkages of global economies. The RBI repo rate has been slashed by 25 point basis points twice within a year to be pegged at 6.0% towards infusing money into the system, keeping cognizance of inflation. However, India would like to continue and increase its robust growth over the next 15, 20 years, hoping to increase its economy by five times by the year 2020, 2030, over 10% growth up to $10 trillion. But although Dr. Mathur has mentioned that we have no immediate need to worry, one has to keep in mind that the peak oil has already happened in 2005. The oil curve is now on the decline. And coal stocks are dwindling fast, the two principal sources of energy, the prime driver of industry and growth. Thus, innovative methods of exploration and alternative sources is the need of the hour. Whether you look at deep sea oil exploration, fracking of shale gas, nuclear power with all its baggages, renewables. One must remember that India embarked on industrialization in the early 1950s after independence. Sri Pranab Mukherjee, when he was a finance minister, stated that three bills were passed in 1948, including the Industries Act, even before the Constitution of India. Ladies and gentlemen, he made this statement at a program of the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry. However, despite that, the manufacturing sector is still stuttering in the very lower double digits. If you look at steel, as a prime indicator of industrial advancement, India produces only around 8 TM TPA compared to China at 10 times at 800 MTPA. And the saying is in the last 15 years, China has been producing steel plants the way we produce chapatis in the kitchen. Well, let's swing back and see where our environmental interventions started. It started, I think, only somewhere in the mid-1980s when the first Department of Environment, the Ministry of Environment was formed and the, the Umbrella Act of EPA was formed in 1986. And what does that leave us? With a very large magnitude of a differential and a very large magnitude of the paradox. What has happened? The inheritance thus includes age-old plants bereft of any air pollution or water pollution measures or solid and hazardous waste management systems and we have to live with them for compelling reasons as I was just discussing with the Honorable Minister a while ago. Our open cast mines which contribute to area volume source emissions have caused extensive land denudation and ecological degradation subsidence, groundwater depletion, and many other environmental impacts. We are probably coming to terms with this existential issue 
only very recently. Just one example, the latest notification in environmental appraisal of September 2006 is a very streamlined, unambiguous document, and hence, ladies and gentlemen, the Chamber at its sustainability conclave on the 28th of February released a treatise on this particular subject, which was released by the then Chief Secretary, Dr. Mato, you were present on that very day. Thus, what becomes very important is adoption of advanced technologies in the element of environmental preservation, as this primarily includes at source control of pollution. For example, again I was whispering with the Honorable Minister, adoption of ultra supercritical technologies for power plants, gravitating to IGCC in the next 20 years would be a step in the right direction. Land requirement optimized to less than 0.7 acre per megawatt, water optimized to less than 30 Q secs per 1000 megawatt, two essential commodities but scarce in resource have to be limited. Do remember, only 0.2% of the water available on Earth is available to man for utilization. The rest is contained by glaciers, ice caps, saline seawater, or buried very, very, very deep. As regards mining, we need to switch to underground mining, and I'm sure that would be discussed through the conclave with a lot of international participation here. With the adoption of long wall technologies, employment of delayed sequential blasting, and many, many others. Again, remember, God has not, has not been very kind, and many of the richest mineral deposits are overlain by the richest of forests, and these forests contain medicinal herbs. For example, the Bastar district in Madhya Pradesh, the repository of the largest iron ore deposits of India. Swing around to end of pipe solutions and thereafter are equally important as reduction of particulate emissions 30 mg per normal meter cubed and adoption of low NOx boilers which control your NOx emissions to less than 350 ppm for coal fired plants and maybe less than 50 ppm for gas based power plants. Water pollution systems revolve around maximum reuse and recycling and rainwater harvesting. Solid waste management is resolved around HCSD disposal, adoption of HDP, LDP, LDP geomembranes for ash ponds. Recently, microclimatic issues to address heat island effects to reduction of impervious materials and enhancement of porous substances is of paramount importance. Once again, renewables have simply got to play a larger part in all facets of Ladies and gentlemen, what we need to do is to do away with our tunnel vision approach and take a holistic approach with a much wider vision encompassing the larger canvas. As the going says, do not lose the forest for the trees. And one way of achieving this towards creating sustainable development is by adoption of what is termed in our parlance as the carrying capacity approach. I have a presentation on that, but Deb, no time for it. One more minute only on carrying capacity. Many regions of our country is witnessing a surge in, in development activities as part of resurgent India, involving a varied typology mix of industrial, commercial and residential complexes. While such a trend is certainly welcome, it is imperative to parallelly assess the region's capacity to cope and sustain such development. How much can the area withstand? How much can the area take? How much can the area digest? Is the one question that needs to be succinctly answered, keeping in view its infrastructural resources and environmental attributes. An answer to this question is vital if the development is to be sustainable over a satisfactory period. And this can be carried out only, in my opinion, through this particular approach. Ladies and gentlemen, I try to swing back and forth between what I term the four E's or the four essentials, economy, energy, engineering, and environment 
hoping to lead to a convergence of towards sustainability, which is the theme for today. I will end with a small quote by Maya Anglo, and Maya says, I quote, what we need is less what we think we need. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shutana, for the wonderful uh, theme address. Uh, may I, I have the pleasure now of inviting our Honorable Minister, Sri Shubhandip Chattopadhyay, to deliver the inaugural address of the conclave. Sir. So. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen in the, audi in the audience, and very important personalities on the dais like Mr. Shutanu Ghosh, President, Bengal Chambers and Commerce, Mr. Franz Joseph Saf Hossein, Chairman, Institute of Energy Economics, Kulang. Orun Kumar Mukherjee, Chairman Emirates, Emeritus, Energy Environment Committee, Bengal Chambers of Commerce, Sir Dominic Asquit, High Commissioner UK, Archil Juriasville, Ambassador Georgia, Dev Mukherjee, Chairperson Environment Committee, Dr. Atanu Mathur, Director General of Terry, Sri Tipati, Director General International Solar Alliance. I was listening to the speech given by very important personalities coming across, the, across India and abroad and contributing their opinion, their thinking, their first sight in this conclave. The transforming face of energy, it converges towards sustainability. Well, before I say my pers the, on the subject, well, I think that the back of our mind, we have always a bell is ring ringing. That is the perception of Dr. Hawkins, who has given the warning to the entire world society that within 50 years for global warming the civilization will be finished. Dr. Hawkins has given that warning to the entire civilized society. So it is not only the business purpose. We have assembled not only for the business purpose, for our social commitment, also, we are talking. The nature has given everything. The fossil fuel energy. Nature has given solar. Nature has given us hydro power, hydro power. Nature has given us tidal power. We can also develop power from tidal. Nature has given us biomass gas, power from biomass gas waste energy, wind energy, and atomic energy. There are a number of sources from where we can develop. But at the same time, we should think about that, whether science is a blessing or cause. When we develop power from coal, at the same time, we develop carbon, we develop socks, NOx, and other pollution, polluted particles in the nature. When we develop power from atomic energy, that also creates huge pollution in the nature. 
So civilization is based on that. We'll have to develop power, but at the same time, we'll have to look after the commitment to the entire civilized society of the world. So, I being the minister of power of this state only, when we came in power in 2011, our solar energy was only 2 megawatt. My chief minister, Honorable Srimati Mamata Banerjee, she advised us that so long we don't have any alternative to feed the entire population of West Bengal by alternative energy, we'll have to depend on this fossil fuel, coal and gas and others. But at the same time, we'll have to apply the latest technology to develop other sources of energy. And the main target is solar energy. Yesterday we had a meeting with the uh, delegation from the UK and today there are other many countries that are participating in this conference, this conclave. But I understand that with coming in power we have started to build up plants of solar and we have a project the unique project that is Purulia Palm Storage Turga project. 1000 megawatt project that is clean and green energy. We lift the water from solar and it will come down as a hydro power. So there is no scope of pollution, but we will get power of 1000 megawatt. We have another 900 megawatt project at Purulia also but we'll have to depend on the thermal power also. We are trying to give solar power to 1,500 schools and colleges. We have already completed 500, 1,000 more. Our chief minister's dream project is Alosri. That is, all the government buildings will have to have a solar project on this rooftop all the government buildings. We have already planned to, we have already uh, a functioning a 10 megawatt candle bank solar project. We are thinking of candle top solar project. We are also thinking about already taken the project in our hand that is 10 megawatt, 10 projects of solar in different parts of West Bengal and other 200 megawatt solar park in Midnapur. But, as you know, to, to develop, develop one megawatt of solar power, we need minimum four acres of land. 